Hello and welcome to Caregivers First, the show brought to you by SCAN, helping active adults stay empowered and informed. My name is Lavelle Jones. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to discuss how the pandemic environment influences our health policies and creates challenges and opportunities for caregiver support. I am so pleased to have as my guest today, Heather Howard. Heather is a lecturer in public affairs at Princeton University and is a faculty affiliate of the Center for Health and Wellbeing. She is also director of the State Health and Value Strategies Program. Heather served as New Jersey's Commissioner of Health and Senior Services from 2008 to 2010. In 2017 and 2018, she co-chaired Governor Murphy's Healthcare Transition Committee and the governor later appointed her to the Multi-State Gun Violence Research Consortium and the New Jersey State Health Benefits Value and Quality Task Force. Heather also has significant federal experience, having worked as Senator John Corzine's Chief of Staff, as Associate Director of the White House Domestic Policy Council, and as Senior Policy Advisor for First Lady Hillary Clinton. Heather received her BA from Duke University and her JD from NYU School of Law. Welcome to the show, Heather. Thank you, Lavelle. So pleased to be here. Uh, we are delighted to have you for this uh, important discussion. Uh, Heather, as, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to touch all of us in, in one way or another. So my question is, has the pandemic drawn more focus on our health policies? I think it has, it has, because of, for a couple of reasons. One, we're clearly in the middle of a public health crisis, but it's had a cascading effect and has now triggered an economic crisis. And it's really shown a bright light on our healthcare system and what works and, you know, sadly, more importantly, what is not working, right? So we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing the tragic effect of over, 130,000 people have died so far from COVID-19, but a lot of a lot more people have been sick, and a lot of people have lost their employment because of the economic crisis, and as a result, have lost their health insurance. We have a healthcare system that ties health insurance to employment, and when the economy is going well, that may be that may work for a lot of people, but it's not working where a lot of people have um, are out of work. And, and so a lot of people have lost their, um, lost their health insurance too. So I think it's clearly brought to the fore this question of what kind of a healthcare system do we want to have? And then finally, and I hope we can discuss this too, it's really um, shown a bright light on inequities in our healthcare system. Um, we know that before COVID-19, um, people of color, African Americans and Latinx people, were more likely to be uninsured. And now um, they are facing even greater rates of uninsurance because of the economic downturn, combined with the disproportionate impact that the pandemic is having on people of color. Just to give you one startling statistic, um, Black Americans are, have a, are dying at two and a half times the rate of white Americans from COVID-19. So, you know, well maybe, you know, maybe we can get into what are some of those reasons, but I think we, you know, it's worth pausing to say what were unacceptable disparities before the pandemic are now being exacerbated. Yes. And, you know, for all of us who care, policy needs to be part of the response. Yes, I, I agree with you. And uh, the information about the, uh, inequities, I think, has uh, been something that has enlightened many of us over the, the past few months. And, you know, as, as we deal with this pandemic, I know that I am often thinking about the healthcare system and caregivers. And I know you have just a wealth of experience with the healthcare system and the caregivers' roles in it. Can you share with us, because I think sometimes we overlook all of the contributions that our family caregivers make to the healthcare system. Walk us through a little bit of that, if you would. You know, family caregivers are the backbone of our caregiving system, right? I've seen estimates that 90% of home caregiving is given, is provided by family members. And so, again, even 
pre-COVID, um, uh, family caregiving was so critical for people, um, people with um, people with illnesses or long-term disabilities. Um, family caregiving was so critical, and then I think COVID nineteen has just um, magnified the role of family caregiving. That um, you know, for, I'll give you one example. As people have been um, trying to stay home, and so that we could conserve our healthcare resources for people who were testing positive and needed COVID-19 treatment. It was that much more important for people to be able to stay home. Um, but, you know, just like you, you mentioned at the top, that these are both opportunities and challenges. It's really also exacerbated the challenges of relying on an informal system of caregiving by family members, because as people have been juggling, as caregivers have been juggling caring for family members, whether it's parents or children or siblings who are ill or have disabilities, um, people who were juggling work with caregiving may now be facing uh, this economic disaster. They've lost their paid work outside of home, but are still providing care at home. Um, and the system has, has, has assumed there'd be all this unpaid caregiving that we can't afford now, that people can't afford. And of course, people want to keep family members at home, want to provide um, um, caregiving to their, to their loved ones, but it's that much harder to do it when, um, when one, your paid job outside of the home may have ended. Mm -hmm. And there's some federal support relief for that, but not enough. And imagine, what if you're a caregiver at home caring for a family member? And then your kids um, who are normally in school, school's closed and your kids are at home. So your caregiving responsibilities may have increased yes. as kids can't go to school. Um, and we're looking at, you know, another school year where kids may not be going, may be learning at home virtually and you're trying to care for family members plus also um, oversee and teach and oversee virtual learning. It's like, it's a tsunami for caregivers. Yes, and uh, let me ask you, in terms of the uh, total number of caregivers that we have here in the United States, um, is there such a thing as a, a typical family caregiver? Is it, a, is it a male, is it a female? Are they younger, older? Any statistics on that? I've seen that there are statistics that there are 44 million Americans providing unpaid care for loved ones. So, I mean, think about that. That's more than 10% of our population is a caregiver. And of that group, more than a quarter of them are sandwiched between caring for an aging parent or older adult while raising kids. So um, it's a substantial part of our population, but I'll tell you, it's, it, it's, it's all walks of life. It includes veterans, people with chronic illnesses, elderly adults. We all know we all know people who are caregivers. So there's not one profile, and that's what again provides both the challenges and the opportunities. Is that it's so it's it's every everywhere you look down your block, somebody is providing care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Because I think, you know, uh, often when you mention the number of family caregivers in this country, I think most people are surprised at uh, how many uh, are providing just, a, you know, a critical support for all of us. You mentioned uh, uh, a few minutes ago about uh, unemployment and its impact. And I would think that uh, the current uh, state of unemployment probably uh, does impact uh, caregivers more than perhaps others because caregivers have, you know, double, triple, quadruple duties. Is, is, is that a fair assumption to make? Yes, it is so true, right? They're sandwiched between, the, you know, they, I mean, they have been traditionally perhaps because it's unpaid work, they're working outside the home while they're caregiving at home. But now that may be compounded by childcare responsibilities increasing because of school closure. And now you've got a dramatic increase in unemployment. I mean, the, the unemployment numbers now, the, the closest you know, approximation of what they look like is the 1930s now. When you look at our number of unemployed, it's, it looks like the numbers from the Great Depression in the 30s, the number of unemployed Americans, more than 20% of the country. So um, you've got, again, I keep going back to it, 
feels like a big tidal wave for people is that you're they're applying for unemployment, they're struggling, you know, our systems, our, our safety net system is not as strong as it should be. So people are waiting to get their unemployment, navigating that system while also continuing that unpaid care at home. Yes. Uh, let me ask you about um, caregivers' ability right now to sort of navigate the system and uh, uh, know what policies support them, know what supports are available. What are you seeing in terms of how well during this pandemic our healthcare system is giving that support to our caregivers? You know, look, I think our healthcare system understands the importance of caregivers, but our healthcare system is stretched so thin, right? And that goes from, let's talk about, for example, personal protective equipment. PPE. There's a shortage of PPE, so it's going to the highest need places. So that means intensive care units and hospitals, um, physician offices. Um, but it's so unfortunately, I think caregivers are not. Um, they are the front line here, but I'm not sure they're always seen as the front line by our healthcare system because it's under such stress. Uh, in many parts of the country. Um, we've been, the healthcare system has been deferring routine healthcare services because they've been trying to preserve resources for COVID cases, which of course makes sense, but it means that cr chronic care, if you're a patient with diabetes, you may be putting off your chronic care because, or you, or your parent with a child, you may not be taking your child for a well child visit, which means you're not getting, your child's not getting the vaccines they need, right? So, um, chronic care which we where we know that you know investing in prevention can reduce healthcare burdens down the road and save our healthcare system unfortunately um, we're seeing an alarming drop in chronic care um, visits because both the healthcare system is focused on those with covid and also people understandably are afraid to go because you don't want to get exposed to covid but i worry that that's going to have a really long, um, you know, in policy, we would call it like a long tail. Like we're going to be seeing the costs of deferring care for years, the cost mm -hmm. of kids not getting vaccines, the cost of adults not treating their chronic illnesses um, and deferring care um, because we're going to be seeing that for years, well past even when the pandemic hopefully resolves. Yes. And those are, uh, you know, important uh, considerations for us to take into account. And, and I'm wondering, we have uh, uh, just about 30 seconds before we take a break, but given all that uh, this pandemic has brought to the fore, uh, do you think that uh, we can use our new knowledge to change policy going forward? Do you think this is a, a starting point? Well, I like to be optimistic, so I hope so, right? I mean, often out of these challenges are born improvements when we look back to the Great Depression, the New Deal was born out of the Great Depression and we created um, social security and a lot of protections and are the core of our safety net. So I would hope um, and that this would be the time to sort of learn from these, these tragedies and build more supports for caregivers. Terrific, thank you, Heather. And now we are going to pause for a quick break and uh, please stay with us, we'll be right back. You probably already know that rehabilitation is a must for successful recovery from surgery, injury, or serious illness. What you may not know is that you're free to choose where you go for rehab. In Monmouth and Ocean County, the compelling choice is Care One. Where you choose to go for rehab matters, and with Care One, you have four convenient locations to choose from in Monmouth and Ocean Counties. Care One at Jackson, Care One at Wall, Care One at Homedale, and Care One at King James in the Atlantic Highlands. At Care One, you'll work with a team of experts to develop a plan based on your needs and goals. You will have the full support of caring, compassionate physicians, RNs, licensed therapists, and nutritionists dedicated to helping you recover successfully without setbacks at a pace that makes you comfortable and successful 
in meeting your rehabilitation goals. Once you take the first step with us, you'll never look back. Call 877-99-CARE-1 today and come for a tour. Welcome back to Caregivers First. We're talking with Heather Howard. Heather, I want to uh, pick up where we left off before the break, and we started talking about uh, policies and the future. So I'm going to ask you, what kind of policies do you think that we need to start thinking about and developing as we move forward so that we can continue to support family caregivers? So, you know, let's start with in the immediate, I think it's thinking about things like um, when we develop policies for um, distributing personal protective equipment, PPE, like masks, are we thinking about caregivers? We think about first responders. Well, I think caregivers are on the front line. So how are we distributing um, masks and other personal protective equipment to caregivers? That's the kind of immediate thing we need to think about. Um, another immediate thing we can do is how can we expand access to telehealth services? And that's both for um, um, elderly and, and, and other and disabled people, other people who need caregiving, but for caregivers themselves. How do we make it easier for people to access healthcare services you know, in the very way we're talking right now um, through telehealth? So they don't have to go into doctor's offices, expose themselves to, to COVID, all of the work that goes into traveling and accessing um, transportation. So telehealth has really proven to be a lifesaver for many people. So how do we expand access? And part of that has to do with how do we work with insurance companies to approve the services being offered through telehealth? And importantly, I think Medicare and Medicaid, how can they support access to health, telehealth services? That would reduce burdens on caregivers, I think significantly. But then broader than that, I think there are non, you, know, you wouldn't call them directly health policies, but they, but they are health related, like family and medical leave. How do we give caregivers greater flexibility with their work responsibilities outside of home or work they may be doing from home, but for outside work, that allows them to provide time you know, for their loved ones. And we have a real patchwork of, of family and medical leave laws across the country. Yes. Some states like New Jersey, where you and I live, we have, we have strong uh, family lo leave laws that support caregivers. There, of course, are always ways we can expand them. Uh, but we, we have, uh, our, our federal laws aren't as strong as they could be, and it's been left to the states. So I would encourage you know, people to think about what can their state laws do yes. to support caregivers. Excellent. And I just want to follow up because you mentioned telemedicine. And um, my sense is that as a result of this pandemic environment, there seems to be a lot more activity around telemedicine and it's its possibilities for uh, you know supporting healthcare uh, uh, from afar. Have you seen that that rise in interest in telemedicine? Absolutely, I and mean, we've seen it both from consumers and healthcare providers. Um, and it's amazing to me, actually, from a policy perspective. For 20 years, we've been dating, debating how do we expand access, what role does telehealth have, and then, bam, the pandemic hits us. And what we couldn't do in 20 years, we've been able to do in a couple months because the crisis has forced us to be much more creative. So to me, that's been one silver lining in the pandemic and this crisis has been that we've upped our systems in a way that we were slow to do before. And to me, it's an example of an area of policy where we've been creative in the pandemic that I hope we maintain that creativity. I hope we don't go back to what life was like before. I hope we have increased access to telehealth because I think that has really been a lifesaver for, um, for caregivers. Yes, I, I agree with that sentiment. It would be great if uh, as an outcome of this, we can make our healthcare yes. system better. Uh, exactly. Yeah, it, I totally support that. And as, as we look to making things better, um, what is the role that uh, citizens do or, or can play in, uh, you know, making sure that healthcare policies are developed to benefit their interest? What can the average citizen do? Well, they ought to be engaging because, uh, you know, healthcare is 
is almost one fifth of our GDP, of our gross domestic product, our economy, basically. One fifth of our spending is on healthcare. So when we talk, every, um, every citizen is a healthcare consumer, is affected by healthcare policy, and they ought to engage. Now it can be very, it's unfortunately our system is probably more complex than it needs to be. So it can be daunting, but I really, hope and wish and hope that that all people um, will think about engaging because as a consumer you're affected by healthcare policy whether it's how we handle telehealth how we reimburse how we which hospitals are open or closed um which kind of you know can you see you know can, do we have enough doctors and nurses in our healthcare system to see patients those kind of healthcare policy decisions are being made in state capitals and in Washington. And if you don't engage, those decisions are gonna be made you know, without you. So I strongly encourage people to engage and to think about ways they can have their voice heard. One area in which I think, again, the pandemic, there's a silver lining is there's been more of a focus on having um, electronic engagement by, by, by policymakers, by elected officials, and by, um, and by appointed officials. You know, you mentioned that I was New Jersey's Commissioner of Health and Senior Services. I'm seeing more state officials have online forums where people can weigh in. So sometimes, again, as a caregiver, it may be hard for you to travel to your state capital to go to a public hearing um, uh, because you've got caregiving responsibilities in addition to your paid work outside the home. As more and more of those um, uh, public forums go online, there may be more of that may be the silver lining and the opportunity for people to engage, log on, weigh in and say, wait, that's not working for me. That policy is not working. How do we learn from this crisis and strengthen our safety net to support caregivers? Those are excellent suggestions. Thank you so much, Heather. And you know, uh, staying along those lines of, of what can uh, can people do outside of the policy space, what else can citizens do to support caregivers and really to support our entire healthcare system? So I think there's so much. You know, if, if you're if you're fortunate enough to have the ability to help others now, and we know these are very challenging times, but uh, you know, I'm seeing in my own community a wonderful way that people are rallying around and supporting their neighbors and whether it's um, grocery or pharmacy delivery for those who you know are not able to get out. Um, I think it's peer support systems are so important. Uh, how do you support your neighbors? And finally, I think, you know, respite care is so important, especially for caregivers who are you know, for whom the stresses have become, become even greater to, to the extent that you can provide respite for the caregivers in your neighborhood, whether it's, you know, del delivering, delivering food or services or just providing support and touching base and um, giving, you know, unfortunately we can't, we can't hug our neighbors in the way we wish we could, but we can call people and touch base and help them and ask what can we do i'm going out shopping can i pick things up for you uh what can i do can i drop things off our libraries are finally opening reopening can i go get a book for you um those those kind of uh human touches even if they're not physical touches but human connections are so important they are i i agree with that um thank you so much for that and i i, I appreciate your reminding all of us that you know particularly during this time it's, you know, it's so important to reach out. If it's only, you know, to one other person, that's something that, uh, you know, we certainly can, can all do. Um, Heather, um, as we continue to think about how we're all going to navigate through this pandemic and we think about uh, caregivers, do you foresee the number of caregivers in this country growing over the next five years or do you see it shrinking? What, what is your perspective? I do, I do, because uh, you know, a couple of, there are a couple of factors influencing that. First, we're seeing as the population ages, 
we're seeing an increase in, in, in caregiving as people take care um, of um, um, aging relatives. But I also think, you know, it, we're seeing again that sandwich generation, people uh, more caregiving of, of their children um, as the economic downturn, which I think is going to outlast even the pandemic. People are going to be taking care of their children more. We've seen more and more people, um, you know, young young people moving home um, to live with their. And I'm a parent of a young, of a teenager, and and thinking about you know what are his opportunities. So I think we're seeing it at different ends of the spectrum. I think um, we're seeing an increase in people um, with disabilities, um, and so there are folks who are going to need. So I think yes, there's going to be an increased uh, call for caregiving um, at the same time that again we're seeing this convergence of the pandemic and the economic crisis unfortunately sadly tragically yes and that brings me to one other question that that i just had as i was thinking about a discussion of, of policy development how long does it take to uh, go from uh, developing a health policy into developing a relevant uh, law or regulation that enforces it. That's a great question. It's a, you know, it, of course, it depends, which is not not a great answer. But often it can take years. So for people who feel like, why should I engage in policy? I would argue because policy is constantly evolving and you should be weighing in because sometimes it can take years to develop a policy so um, um you know like it's worthwhile to be intervening at any point to be making your voice heard because it may it may it may be many years in the development now sometimes in a crisis like like we mentioned earlier during a pandemic which forces us to say boy we need to figure out how to do telehealth because nobody can go see the doctor because we're worried about about you know about the community spread of covid we very quickly adopted new policies to promote telehealth but normally that process would take years because there would be public input there'd be community hearings there'd be legislative processes um you know hearings in your state capital so um normally the process a thoughtful policy process can take years and you want that because you want that kind of give and take the good thing i think we've learned is that the policy process can be can be nimble when it needs to be yes absolutely heather thank you for those comments they were great and uh, i am so enjoying this discussion but unfortunately we have run out of time for today's session so again heather um thank you so much for uh taking your time to share your expertise with us. Uh, it was a very robust and a thought-provoking discussion. Thank you so much. And I do hope that you'll come back and visit us again in the future. I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. And I also want to thank our viewers. I hope that you found today's discussion relevant and of value. So please join us for the next episode of Caregivers First. Until then, stay safe and take care.